interesting to me. Earlier, you brought up Henry Singleton. I like Henry Singleton. I've read this really good book called The Outsiders. I know that's probably your Bible. Is that right? I love that book. Okay. So The Outsiders, um, it's a great book. It's about 12 CEOs who are, quote, outsiders. The the commonalities is they are like kind of quiet. They're kind of afraid of the press. They are typically in locations like Nebraska or uh somewhere not Silicon Valley or New York, and they just get pretty good results, but they get it every single year for like 50 years. So they'll like grow something by like 20% or 15%, but they do it every year for so long that by year 20, 30, 40, it's like, oh my gosh, they're Warren Buffett. They're Henry Singleton, yada, yada, yada. Who is this guy? So yeah, and the idea is basically that they're capital allocators, which is kind of a weird nerdy term, but it basically just means they they're really good at putting their money into buckets where they can make a lot more of it versus investing in the wrong thing. And what what a lot of people miss is you can have the most innovative CEO in the world, but if they misallocate their dollars and they put it into, you know, low return R&D versus high return acquisitions or whatever, you can have a very bad result despite being very innovative and a great uh, leader and manager. Um, so Henry Singleton is like, everyone thinks Warren Buffett's the greatest investor of all time. Henry Singleton, um, you know, I think he died in the 80s, but I'm pretty sure he actually has a better record than Warren Buffett. And nobody really knows his name. They only know it because of the outsiders. Um, there's been one other book written about him, but he basically got into these very niche very technical fields where they would do like, um, it'd be like navigation equipment that's on like a, you know, a fighter jet or random little like diodes for, for circuitry and all this kind of stuff. But he'd find these niches where they could kind of own it or have a very dominant position in it. What's, there's this very simple, um, kind of way of thinking about um, investing. And his whole thing was when the market is overvalued and crazy, that's a great time to issue stock and to sell things. And when the market is undervalued, you want to be buying, not only buying back your own company. So if you don't own your entire company, you want to go and you know buy back more stock and you want to be investing then. And so that approach is, you know, it's very simple. It, do, it doesn't sound like rocket science, but I think it's a really important thing for people to be thinking about right now. And I think now is a great time to be scanning your portfolio or businesses and going, how can I, um, how can I basically take advantage of valuations right now and either, you know, issue stock or use my stock in my business to go buy stuff uh, or just wait for opportunities? Because right now it's like a crazy seller's market. Which is shockingly the hardest part is the not doing anything. Um, so in time, like you have far more perspective than this. You're uh, more successful than I am, and you're a couple years older than I am. So you uh, just a little everything that I am interested in. You are, but more. How are you and other people who you've met that that buy into this? How do you guys just sit and chill? Uh, how do you not do new stuff? Because I, I say to myself all the time, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna like pounce on X, Y, and Z. I got to wait. I got to wait. I got to wait. I get so antsy and I can't... Like It's I, it's hard. Well, there's a reason I'm starting a, a, a sugar-free bakery, right? Like this, That's the stuff. That's honestly my, my secret to not doing too much is I distract myself. Um, and, you know, before COVID, it'd be distracting myself with sports and, you know, playing uh, bridge and hanging out with friends and going on walks and stuff. Now it's starting businesses and they're really small little businesses. They're like hobby businesses. Um, you know, it's like um, me just kind of playing with 10 or $20,000, but it's enough to keep me distracted and happy and active and feel like I'm doing something. But in reality, I'm sitting on my hands and building up cash. And... What like you? So you still have enough time to do that and do the WeCommerce thing, which for those of you who don't know, Andrew, I don't know how you describe it. If you started it, which or you owned it, I don't know what the right terminology is, but you have this thing that went public and is currently like, I don't know what it is today, but like many hundreds of millions of dollars in market cap. Yeah, we started a business about 10 years ago. Um, we met the founder um, of Shopify. And at the time, we were running a design agency. And he said, hey, we want to launch themes on our platform. We want people to be able to sign up and have different designs they can choose from. And we'll let you guys sell uh, these themes on the platform for you know $150 to $250. And so we were kind of thinking like, hey, it's a small little Canadian company. These guys seem nice. Let's do it. 
And uh, we started doing it and Shopify just grew into a behemoth and we rode the whale and did really well. And we actually sold the business in 2013. We didn't realize how big Shopify would get. And then we bought the business back in 2019. Um, we did, did a bunch of... Did you buy back for more than you sold it? Way more. Yeah, I Damn, think it was five, five times, six times. Um, Damn. So we bought it back. We we and we said like we you know we're just making a big bet. We think Shopify is going to get a hell of a lot bigger. And we made a holding company called WeCommerce, and we started buying businesses and kind of building a mini version of Tiny um, within the Shopify ecosystem. And then we took it public in December, um, and uh, we're listed on the TSX Venture Exchange up in Canada. And uh, as of right now, I don't know if this is in Canadian dollars or American, but it's six hundred sixty-three million dollar market cap. I think that's US. Yeah, I think uh, Canadian. That's Canadian. So yeah. six hundred yeah. six hundred and sixty-three Canadian dollars. So it's pretty big. Um, how? But I mean, like you're saying, you're like just sitting there, not doing anything, just waiting, waiting, waiting. It seems like you're doing something. Well. I mean, I'm. We started this podcast by me saying I'm stressed out and busy, right? So I think I I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea that you know it's more I'm filling my time when I have it by distracting myself with this other stuff, and that all of the things I'm focused on right now, for the most part, like while I'm looking at buying businesses, everything's so overpriced that I don't want to make a swing on the wrong thing. So I'm filling the rest of my time with other things. And one of those things is not email. You told me the other day that you, um, for the first time ever, which is actually shocking to me that it's the first time ever, you've hired someone or you've asked your assistant to completely manage your email. And you said something like, this is the first day I've tried it. TBD, if it actually works. Is it working? Yeah. And what are you doing? Yeah, so I'm doing I'm doing two things that are kind of interesting. So um, one... I fully delegated my email to my assistant. So um, I get, I, I've started getting over the last couple of years, like 200 or 300 emails a day. Um, and honestly, it was just making me kind of miserable. Like it was just, I've, I've tried all the best practices and we even built a, a company called Mailman that basically like slows down your email and, and does do not disturb on it and stuff. But it just wasn't enough. And I hit my breaking point a couple of weeks ago. I was just spending like five hours a day doing email and I set up tech support software. I pipe my email into it. And I have um, my assistant. And then we have another assistant we have in the Philippines. And they basically monitor the email and they have a set of rules. So I wrote out like, if someone asks me to sign a document, send it to this person on our legal team, they'll review it. And then if they say yes, you can sign it as long as it's below this amount. Um, if someone requests an interview, go and look at the podcast, see how many fall, uh, downloads it gets. And if it's above this, you can schedule it or whatever. And so I made like 10 of these rules. And now I'm getting like 20 emails a day because the only ones that come through to me are the ones where it's a friend asking me a direct question or it's one of our CEOs or you know a go, no, go on an investment. And so it just freed me up by like two or three hours. And it's a classic example of like the e-myth kind of where you're like, you know, desperately doing all this stuff that you don't really need to be doing because you've always done it. Um, so that's been awesome. What's, um, what's, and then, what's the e-myth? Sorry, go ahead. I don't know what the, the e-myth is. The, oh, you don't know that book? Um, I've, I, I, I've seen it. I, I don't know what the myth is. I've never actually read oh, it. <laughs> the e-myth, the, the entrepreneur myth, I think it is. But um, I think that's I thought, the best. I thought, see, I always thought it meant electronic. The elect, like it. No. It, it's it's an amazingly badly written book, but it's a very important message. And it was like transformational for me like 12 years ago. And the idea is basically um, when people start businesses, they don't build systems and they don't delegate, right? So uh, the, the uh, person who loves baking starts a bakery. And then before they know it, they're staying up until two baking. And then they wake up at seven in the morning to mop the floor. And then they're behind the till all day. They're miserable. They're stressed. And they thought they were creating this utopian business that they wanted. And in reality, it just sucks and they're miserable. And the reason it sucks and they're miserable is because they don't delegate, they don't build process, they don't hire people. When they do hire people, they don't give them a chance. And so it's all about how to delegate. Got it. Okay. And what were you saying about the email thing? So, I, and then the other thing I did, um, which I, has been really fun, um, I, I used to like, I used to do this myself. So I used to cold email. I still do it actually. I still cold email entrepreneurs that I think are really cool and I want to meet or ask them questions. 
And like five years ago, I started getting emails from young entrepreneurs saying, hey, can you look at my startup or can you give me an opinion on this? And I used to write really thoughtful responses. And then as I got more email, I just couldn't respond. And I felt really, really guilty about this. 100% and I just like, same. I'd Same. like delete it. Sometimes I just be like delete, and other times I'd be like one line response, and I'd be like, "Fuck, they think I'm an asshole." One hundred percent same, dude. I've so, done that with yeah. some people, and then I've eventually become friends with them. And you know how, like on Twitter, you can see, like, you recognize people's thumbnail over and over. There's this one guy the other day that I've seen him talk to me all the time, and then I've been hanging out with this other person, like through a friend of a friend, like three different times now, and I knew his name, and I'm like, "Fuck." You're the guy I've been ignoring. Yeah, I'm so yeah. sorry, man. I'm so sorry. I, I, I didn't realize it. I, so anyway, I do the same thing and it kills me. When you never know who they're going to become or they could have this great idea if you just talk to them and get on the phone. And so um, what I ended up doing, I realized I was actually doing myself a disservice by responding because I just say like, you know, this is too long. Write me a shorter, you know, question or whatever it is. You know, the douchey, like yeah, I'm too busy yeah. stuff, like, right? I don't know what you're asking. So... Now I write them back. I have a template or my assistant writes them back and just says, Hey, um, I don't respond to these via email. What I like to do is I do an, e an AMA, ask me anything every month. And if you, if you can afford to donate to charity, um, you know, just as a way of, you know, paying it forward or whatever. And so if someone's rich, if someone has a big company already, I'm like, Hey, go donate some money. If they're a first time entrepreneur, we don't expect them to. And then Chris and I just do a monthly AMA and then everyone gets to enjoy the answer we do. And so it's dude. So it's been crazy. So we, we've already donated $58,000 to charity from this. So we basically, whatever the community donates, we double it and then we donate it to a local charity. So for we've donated 58K, half of which came from people who donated. And then uh, it's probably saved me two or three hours a month of just oh, not responding wise. to these emails. So um, it's, it's like a really great hack. Should I copy that? I think that's great. Totally. Did, yeah. Did you absolutely. make that up? Uh, I, yeah, I think we made it up. That's wonderful. That is such a good idea. Where'd you send the 56K to? Have you picked your thing uh, yet? We did one. One was like a, uh, it's called Bridges for Women. I think, I think it was. Um, and it's for women that are transitioning out of abusive households. And then the other one was uh, a gym, a local gym. Some guy set up a gym for uh, handicapped people because there's no equipment for handicapped people in town. And so it's somewhere you can go and work out if you're, you know, uh, paraplegic or something. 